This podcast is hosted by R Double P. If you are easily spooked, creeped, or offended, this might not be the podcast for you. Let's get right into the news. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to I Think My Fridge Is Haunted. <laughs> oh, very creepy podcast for very creepy people. I'm Gemma. I'm Lana. I was about to say I'm Gemma. <laughs> and I'm Gemma. Great. Cool. <laughs> I'm Lana. Uh, how are you going? I'm good. It has been so bonkers the last few weeks. I feel like I've been saying to a few people, I feel like we're all hitting the um, start of the year burnout. Mm-hmm. The year just like comes roaring in. We all go as hard as we can. And around Easter time, we all start to go, oh, I'm a bit tired. Yes. I'm totally. Like, I'm ready for another Christmas right now. Not actually not Christmas, but just a rest. Not Christmas. Um, I'm not ready for Christmas I'm not, not ready yet. for Christmas. I think like <laughs> the huge um, Easter we had this year, we had like a five-day like uh, break for, for some people, for the lucky people. There was like Good Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yes. Easter Monday and Tuesday. Like I think that's how it always happens. Um, but it was um, – for some, it was nice to have a break. For others who have to – Work. Work. <laughs> it, um, it just kept on going. So, yeah, I don't know about you, but I am feeling a little bit tired. But um, excited to be here, Gemma. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> how are you going? Good. I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. I'm going to talk about some serious business. I'm just busy. I'm yeah, just so busy right just... now. It's a, it's a lot. Is going it like on. when you get, as you get older, does it just feel like there's less hours in the day, less yes. days in the week? Like, where does it go? I don't know. When you're like nine, you're like, I'm bored. There's and now you're doing. like, oh my God, I wish I had time to be bored. I would kill <gasps> for an extra hour. Please. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. Um, yeah, would you say that you wanted some, some quiet time in the countryside? I would love some quiet time in the countryside. Well, listen to this from The Guardian. Um, in France, people who are moving to the countryside because they're fed up like us. Fair. Um, Especially in France. <laughs> they're complaining. It's too noisy. It's too noisy? It's, yes. In the it's, countryside? It's too noisy. Um, the French Parliament has adopted a law in an effort to put an end to hundreds of noise complaint cases brought by disgruntled neighbours. Every year, mostly new arrivals from towns seeking rural peace and quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, those who move to the countryside cannot demand that country people who feed them change their way of life. <laughs> so... <laughs> They're basically they're 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 moving out there and they're and they're saying um, there's cows the cows are noisy <laughs> the cows are noisy the uh, roosters they're noisy oh oh sorry tractors oh they're yeah. also noisy um, <laughs> what do they expect <laughs> I know <laughs> uh, so from now in France people who decide to live near next to uh, or above an existing farm shop, bar or restaurant cannot complain about the noise or any other inconveniences. That's so funny. (laughs) Animal noise is a regular cause of rustic rows in France and often viewed as a symbolic as symbolic of the clash between those living in rural areas who have long kept animals or rung church bells. The oh, church come bells on. are too noisy. It's too much. And privileged incomers from urban areas of France or abroad who have moved to or bought second homes in the countryside. So French judges have seen a number of complainants troop through their courts, including neighbours annoyed by Morris the noisy rooster who survived a legal attempt to silence him in 2019. Ducks, geese, cows, and even cicadas. Oh, my God. Stop the cicadas. Stop the cicadas. Has faced attempts to shut them up. (laughs) In May last year, gendarmes, I don't know what gendarmes is, a person turned up at the home of 92-year-old Colette Ferry to remove three frogs from her garden pond. After complaints by neighbours. Leave the frogs alone. So you're coming into the animals' homes and telling them to shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
In, uh, oh my lord, Le Bousset in the Var Provence, a mayor refused to kill the local cicadas after tourists complained they were too loud. Oh my god. So they're coming from busy, bustling cities where it'd be so loud all the time to the countryside with nature sounds. I think what they expected was silence. Oh, well, yeah. I think they wanted there to be silence and I think that they were surprised when they got none. Yeah. <laughs> what? Nature? Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Tr- tractors. Oh, I, I love... <laughs> I love and hate the attempt on the rooster. I bet that rooster like went them. I bet he was like, oh, get out of my, get in my coop, get in my area, <laughs> get in my town. He's the sheriff. <laughs> anyway, I think what I'm trying to say is people are still being dicks. <sighs> just it's like, just it hasn't changed from from last week. I love the judge is like, no, 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 you don't get to complain. Actually, <laughs> I mean frogs. Come, come on, on. We've got frogs in our backyard, and I love them. I love the little frogs. I love them. I love them. They're so cute and they sound so cute. They do. And nature sounds are comforting. Like yes. Most people go to sleep with white noise, which is probably nature sounds. It's lovely. Mm. Embrace it. Don't mm. be dickhead and try to. At least France doesn't have kookaburras. Oh, mate. They would suffer here. They would suffer so hard. What is this? What is is this bird? (laughs) Um, I've walked past a a bird a few times that makes the loudest noise I think I've ever heard a bird. And a few times I've been like, shut up. Shut up. What kind of bird was it? I don't know. It's like a little black, little, I don't know, medium-sized little black one with a yellow beak. Not Um, a minor bird. Maybe. I hate minor birds. It's, it, it, I can't even, I couldn't even replicate the sound, but it's a very loud, long, pro- prolonged, uh, what, what do birds do? Squawk. Yeah, yeah squawk, squawking. I was like, it's not a tweet. It certainly <laughs> isn't that. Um, and then I'd be like, please shut up, just not today. Like, you know, when you're like really irritable mm. and then just something like nature happens mm. and then it would just look at me and then just like squawk louder and I'm like, that's fair. It so. sounds like a minor bird. They're I, such wankers. Yeah, they're I think I've talked about our minor birds um, previously yes. and they're the ones that swoop me oh. and my dog and I Maybe shake I'm my fist on them. A pox Nature. on your family. <laughs> Speaking of pox, <laughs> shall we move pox. on? That's right. Shall we get these facts out of the way? Yep, you go first. Woo, woo, woo. Facts from the freezer. Facts from the freezer. Oh, okay. Did you know that the Chopper Chop Chupp logo was designed by Salvador Dali? Stop. The surrealist artist designed the logo in 1969. It does kind of so, look like his. Massage. I was gonna say it's flowing. Look, it's 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 the it's like the flower yellow background, and then yeah, the chopper chop. Chup, the original one's very like normal kind of bold writing, and then it's got like a swirly for the chop part of it. I love that. So there you go. Wow, that's wild. What do you say the slogan. It's in I assume Spanish, which I cannot read. Um, translates to "It's round and long lasting." Wow. Salvador Dali. <laughs> it is round and long lasting. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Salvador Dali everywhere. <laughs> That's my fun fact. <laughs> All right. Shall we get serious? So, did you ha- do you have a fact or is that 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 it? My fact's part of my story. Oh, okay. All right. I'm so, so excited. So, immunity from plague may follow family lines. A gene called the CCR5 Delta 32 can be passed down from people who have caught plague and survived. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Science is rad. Science is rad. (laughs) I wonder if we have it. Yeah, like... like, Yes. The, uh, oh, I, 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 I skipped COVID once. I, I evaded it once. So um, I think I've got it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we are diving back into plague, my favourite subject in the entire world. Part three, baby. This is part three. Boo, 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 boo. So we've been to the 14th century mm-hmm. previously. Remember when we did that? Oh, yes. We were peasants. We were peasants. Lords of the Manor. Kind of got like corrected on King, a lot of common, with France, blah, common blah, blah, blah. mythos, I suppose. Yes. Kind of yes. told us about that. And yes. Corrected our knowledge, which was great. And we're going to move 
through history now. We're we're moving a little bit further into the next big the plague next section. So my sources were some books: The Diary <laughs> of Samuel Pepys, read by Kenneth Branagh. Thank the Hello. Lord. So Is that you delicious. Can, oh, so good. I listen to it like while I sleep. Oh yeah. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> nature sounds plague. Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> you can listen to the diary of Samuel Pepys just on YouTube, just read by randoms. <gasps> Lovely. So boring. Ah, oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kenneth Branagh walks into the picture. All of a sudden, it's my favorite book that it's I've like, ever listened to. Hold my mic. Let's go, dude. So good. <laughs> I also uh, listened to 1666 by Rebecca Rydell, which is a super interesting book. Mm. I also listened to a book called Time Traveler's Guide to Restoration. Oh no, Time Traveler's Guide to Restoration Britain by Ian Mortimer. Uh, I also listened to The Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. And I listened to The Great Plague, A People's History by Evelyn Lord. And there was a documentary that I watched called Great Fire and Plague, Absolute History YouTube channel. And I also looked at an article from Live Science. Um, I also watched an episode of Drunk History UK (laughs) that I thought would be uh, useful. It was not. (laughs) Just entertaining. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Let's go in. Let's Let's go in. In September 1664, a dull coloured comet flew across the skies of England, signalling the beginning of the next great pestilence. It was the first of two comets that would visit the country over a two year period. Mm. In 1666, a brighter comet would herald the beginning of the Fire of London, which, although devastating, brought an official end to the disease that had literally plagued the city for almost two years. Wow, that's so interesting. I had no idea. What an omen. Yes. Where people had previously lit fires in the streets to burn away the miasma of the bubonic plague, the city itself would burn away any bad air left behind, as well as 13,000 homes and almost 90 churches. (sighs) Air that had taken over 100,000 lives during what we know as the Great Plague. (sighs) So, plague from... 1350 where we were before to 1665 so we're really jumping off over a few centuries here a decent amount of time so let's look at england and how it's changed since we last visited Mm -hmm. it's still a very religious country and it's a hard working country too so we're in the middle of the time where uh the the pendle witches have been persecuted not long ago Mm -hmm. The Puritans are about to travel to America. In fact, they already have travelled to America. They're starting to settle there. And the Salem witch trials will take place in another 30 or so years. Stay tuned for that. Stay tuned. We will be revisiting. It seems like there's a theme this season. I've been living in the 17th century for the past (laughs) six months. I'm sure it's done wonders for your mental health. (laughs) Since the 14th century, we've seen an end to feudalism and the uprising of the peasants. People are free to run their own businesses and lands, and we have a diverse workforce of craftspeople and merchants, as well as legal, military and health professionals. So people are working across a wide spectrum of society. A little bit more freedom of what they want to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what careers they want to pursue. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. more cosmopolitan. Fabulous. London itself is now a much more modern city. Tudor houses fill the streets, reaching much higher than residential buildings ever had, with the exception of castles, palaces, the tower. Of course, of course. Buildings in the city are cramped with people, sometimes housing several families at a time. Mm. But the thing is, like, people want to be in London, you know, it's the place. Yeah, it's it's the place to be. Wasn't there, like... um renting out like a corner of your lounge room a thing and things like that so. like families on families on families not right. even like full homes to yourself yeah mm. yeah and great place for a plague to start oh yeah so L- london city is only a fraction of the size of what it is now and it was situated north of the thames and west of the tower the ancient wall around london that had stood since the Roman occupation in around AD 200, 
although in a, in a state of disrepair in some places, was still visible and acted as a sort of boundary to the city. Mm-hmm. Okay. So those on the inside of the wall are seen as the higher class, while those on the outside are, are more of a working class. Yes, right. Quite the, literally a class system right. running. Yeah. There are around 350,000 people living in London at this time. Allegedly, because some of the a lot of places like history say different numbers. Numbers doesn't add up. <laughs> the streets are alive with industry, and the feudal system is long gone. There appears in society another hierarchy, including a sort of middle class now. Right, right. So remember, we had the hierarchy where we had the crown, and then we had the churches, and then we had the the knights and the manors, and then the peasants, and the we've now got this kind of like middle class, uh, where the working class, like the, the, the 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 peasants have kind of rose up, yeah, and make, they make can, their own money, they can make their own money, yeah, yeah. Although an element of modernity has been established in architecture, warfare, art, entertainment, and fashion. Old superstitions still linger along with a remarkably low level of hygiene and a high tolerance for violence. Mm. So it's a modern city, but, you know... Old habits die hard. Crazy stuff still goes down. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For example, in the centre of the city, for over two decades, sat three heads on spikes (laughs) outside Westminster Hall. Um, so warning. There or? actually were lots of heads on spikes for years and years and years, but I'm just focusing on these three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is essentially like the major shopping precinct. So you're going to Chadston and there's <laughs> heads on spikes outside and you're just like just popping oh, in. Oh, yeah. People taking get my selfies. Coffee pods <laughs> from the Nespresso store. Of course. Right. <laughs> So the heads belonged to traitors to the crown, Oliver Cromwell, Henry Ireton, and John Bradshaw. And they were displayed as a sign to the people that traitors would not be tolerated. So some old systems are still in play. We're not quite um, hiding away the the murdery aspect yet. So this is what we know as the time of Restoration England. And these guys up on the spikes have their own wild story. But long story short, Charles II ordered their bodies to be dug up after they died, rehung, and then their heads placed on the spikes in public. This is sound familiar. That's right? The hope of Hopes. our era. Yes. <laughs> it just must be like, I mean, it is such an insult to not only die, but then be brought out again. And let's killed. hang him again. Yeah, let's get him. Oliver Cromwell is a name that, is familiar to me. Um, He's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, interesting end too. <laughs> so to very quickly go over the political climate of the time, this is a time in English history known as the Restoration. And basically, so Charles I is overthrown by a political activist called Oliver Cromwell, who, who he actually ruled as a sort of like president for about right. five years until his death from natural causes in 1658. There you go. So he, he actually overthrew the crown. He was like, we don't want a king anymore. We want to be not an emperor, more of a president type yeah. of person. Uh, early stages democracy, I suppose. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So Charles's son uh, remained – so he – when Cromwell overthrew Charles I, he had him beheaded. <laughs> so he actually killed the king. Wow. And Charles I's son, he went into exile. And he rema- remained in exile uh, in Scotland, England, France, I believe, until one day he's invited to come back and rule as Charles II of England. Okay. Just invited him back? Pretty much. Right. I mean, that's like a whole other episode. Yeah, I was like, going to say it's long pro- story short. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's getting out of hand. Come back. <laughs> So, in the years since England has officially had a monarch on the throne, the country has fallen into a state of Puritanism. And some would say falling backwards towards superstition, Mm -hmm. uh, unjust judgment and barbarianism. So, Charles II is back and we have a king on the throne. He's he's actually quite a good king. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, pretty well liked. Uh, And he's an advocate for religious 
freedom. So that's a first. Okay. If you think about it, only a hundred years previous, we had Henry the Eighth. <laughs> then we had freaking Mary. Oh yeah. Well, well right. I mean, we had uh, some of the biggest tyrants. Yeah. We had we had Mary, who was like would kill people for Catholicism. Yeah. Then we had Elizabeth was kind of like a little bit ambiguous. Like, was mm. she a Protestant? What, whatever. She liked us dressing up like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for Charles II to come back and go, you know what? Be yourself. Actually, can we it's just kind of chill? Can we just chill a little bit, everyone? We've been through yes. a lot. And he's much more forward thinking than Cromwell, who who was a Puritan. So if Cromwell had have been in charge during this plague outbreak, I think things would have been different. Mm. It's not fun to think about um, like uh, different laces of history. Like what if just this changed? Like what would be different? What's the outcome? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th- from what I've read, um, I mean, I'm no expert on this Cromwell story, but it seems to me that he was a little bit more of a right wing protestant puritan and he wanted more people to be of the puritan faith yeah he knows best well Well, allegedly allegedly so although plague came and went through the years since we last last left it was it was never really eradicated right in fact it became a fairly standard part of life in the 15th and 16th century however england had not seen a really large scale epidemic for some time Sounding familiar as well. Yes. <laughs> oh. The interesting thing is like, you know, when lifetimes and generations go without having a pandemic, people forget how how it works. Yes. The really interesting part is it follows a really similar pattern every single time. This is exactly the thing, right? Like just before COVID in particular, like people were like, no, no plague, no, like no, no um pandemic could happen but it's like 100 years previously in the 1920s it was spanish i feel like we've already yeah. spoken about this but like history repeats itself guys like it, but if it gets far enough away it's like well that can't possibly happen mm-hmm. yeah yeah absolutely and and the um, viruses evolve yeah and the practices and things like that get forgotten and yeah but also the the social factions mm-hmm. that begin to appear yes it's just like century after century it's such a familiar picture yeah it's so strange isn't it yeah destined to repeat itself so in 1625 40 000 people died from plague in london with the average lifespan at the time being approximately 63 years of age and i'm probably being a bit generous there. yeah <laughs> many people are not old enough to have lived through the last large outbreak mm. even though it was only 40 years before so there was also a sizable outbreak in 1603, just after the death of Elizabeth I. But back to Restoration England. Uh, on the continent, a large outbreak of plague took place in late 1664. And small, like just little numbers of plague cases started to surface in London. So much of this time is recorded by a man named Samuel Pepys. Kenneth Branagh. (laughs) Kenneth Branagh. Famously uh, acted by Kenneth Branagh. He is Kenneth Branagh. In my mind, he is Kenneth Branagh. So one way that we know a great deal about London during the Great Plague was a diarist called Samuel Pepys. And he was a prominent naval administrator with many colleagues at court and he was regularly in company with the king. Famous for journaling his life extensively, his diaries are full of not only observations of society and day-to-day life, but also some fabulous shady comments and insults. Oh my God, He's yes. He's actually quite a fun guy. <laughs> so here's a guy, he's a naval administrator, he is a bitch. <laughs> he is that bitch. He's wealthy, he's well-dressed, he likes gossip. Hell he yeah. likes to go out in London and talk to people. Mm-hmm. Get the latest goss. He really, Get the really tea. does. So he had loads of affairs with different ladies, although he seems to have a really good relationship with his wife. Oh, um, good for them, I guess. <laughs> 
He's known as a plague, a plague chronicler, but he really just wrote about everything he did and he enjoyed a very nice upper middle class lifestyle. So, like I say, he, I wouldn't call him a plague chronicler. I would have just called him a 17th century chronicler of daily life yeah. in London. Yeah. So, in one of his 1665 entries, just to give you an example of his being a busybody. Yes, good. He writes, so when he, every morning he writes up, like I got up. <laughs> Good. Sparkles. Up, up and after sending my wife to my Aunt White's to get a place to see Turner hanged. I to the office where we sat all the morning. And at noon, going to the change and seeing pl- people pl- flock in, I inquired and found that Turner was not yet hanged. And so I went among them to Leadenhall Street and at the end of Lime Street, near where the robbery was done, and to St. Mary Axe where he lived. And there I got for a shilling to stand upon the wheel of a cart in great pain above an hour before the execution was done. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you want to see better? I've got a cart. Yeah. Give me some money Give and me you money. can stand on the wheel. You can stand on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Best seat in the house. He, delaying the time by long discourses and prayer one after the other in hopes of a reprieve, but none came, and at last was thrown over the ladder in his cloak. A comely looking man he was, and kept his countenance to the end. I was sorry to see him. It was believed that there was twelve or fourteen thousand people in the street. Whoa! Holy shit, that's a lot of people. Yeah, so no Netflix. Got to no, go watch it. Hang yeah, well, yeah, this is the entertainment, isn't it? Um, he also talks about fairly fun, frivolous things at times, as described in The Great Plague, A People's History. Pips and Evelyn both mentioned a new fashion for men. The vest, a sort of waistcoat. <laughs> Pips. Who first saw it at court on the 17th of October, 1666, remarked that the court is full of vests. <laughs> the court is full of vests. Evelyn saw it the day after at the court of Star Chamber. He thought that the fashion was of Persian origin and he had his own vest and tunic to wear on the 30th of October. <laughs> Peeps got his on the 4th of November. Oh, Peeps. So Peeps is, he's that guy. He, th- he is that guy. I just like, how lucky are we that people were doing this? They were shit. documenting what was going on day to day. Yeah. Like frivolous stuff like that, but it's so important to have. Yeah. Thank you, Peeps. But in between vests and hangings, he does talk about plague. Oh, good, good, yeah. good, good. Yeah. <laughs> the main two things to worry about. <laughs> During the early 17th century, so we're going back to actual plague now, but I just okay. wanted to set the scene, the set context the of London at this time, what's going on. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about the bills of mortality. All right. During the early 17th century, a weekly document was printed and sold called the bills of mortality. For a penny, one could view the numbers of deaths in each parish of London, as well as the cause of death. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a it's a page, and it's just columns and columns of who died, who died, and what illness they died from, or oh what my cause gosh. of death. Can given Lady Whistledown a run for her money. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> some bills of mortality from the first weeks of the Great Plague are incorrect or contain gaps, and this is due to a number of reasons. In the early days, cases of plague are written off as spotted. Fever, also known as typhus. Right, I see. It is possible that the first cases took victims so quickly that all onlookers had to go by was a rash or a severe headache. And that could be anything. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of different illnesses going around. Right. Yes. Another reason that the bills of mortality may have been incorrect was that many health record keepers fled the city when cases started to grow. They knew what was up. They split. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, go into the... <laughs> <laughs> Picks up bags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go to the bathroom. <laughs> Plane. <laughs> <laughs> so only a few record keepers stayed in London to carry out this important work. 
In fact, the College of Surgeons and Physicians was so bereft of staff during the Great Plague that it was looted. Whoa. Okay. They'd just be gone. Stay <laughs> out of here. Yeah. People be taking advantage. So one surgeon who stayed in London was Nathan- Nathan- Nathaniel Hodges, who was kind of like this plague's antit. Do you remember Guy de Chauliac, the Pope's yes. physician in the 14th century? Yes, he I was do. like sit betwixt two fires. Yeah, yeah, he's coming up with ideas to get Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cure. And and Guy de Chauliac was also that guy where all the doctors pissed off. Yes. He stayed and he did what he could and he also recorded his findings. So this is this version. Yeah, yeah. this version. I don't really talk about Nathaniel Hodges in, in this version, but if you are interested in his work, just Google loads of stuff will come up. Uh-huh. So where did it come from this time? So before the Great Plague of London, the pestilence ravaged France, Italy, the Netherlands and Portugal. It was said that in the war between England and the Netherlands, the distemper had crossed the sea by way of soldiers, but also through trade items such as linens. Right. Classic. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> soldiers and linen. That's usually the case. Plays are, have been distributed by soldiers for millennia. Years and years and years and years. And years. Yeah. 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 So we did have a sort of system in place for preventing plague from coming in from the continent. In the book 1666, it is stated that, quote, at the recommendation of the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Lawrence... A quarantine unit was established at Canvey Island at the mouth of the Thames estuary to isolate any, I've written inflected, but it's (laughs) infected ships and crew before they could approach England. However, it seems that by some manner the plague comes into London anyway. I mean, doesn't it always? I guess there's only so many you know, days, weeks, months that you can hold it off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very smart with the quarantine station, guys. Good you effort. You did your best. Probably, like, a little less intense, but it's uh, she's still be coming. Mm, mm. So Daniel Defoe, in his book, said, the first person that died of the plague was on December 20th or thereabouts, 1664, and in or about Longacre. Whence the first person who had the infection was generally said to be from a parcel of silks imported from Holland and first opened in that house. But after this, we heard no more of any person dying of the plague or of the distemper being in that place until the 9th of February. So we've got like two, like almost six weeks. It's a decent amount of time. Yes. He says, which is about seven weeks after. And then one more was buried out of the same house. And then it was hushed and we we were perfectly easy as to the public for a great while. For there were no more entered in the weekly bill to be dead of plague until the 22nd of April when there was two more buried, not out of the same house, but out of the same street. Okay. But still, this is like going on for like four or five months. Just yeah. in this one little area, there's like four. It's kind of sprinkling of plague. Simmering, I mm. guess. Defoe goes on to say, and as near as I can remember, it was out of the next house to the first. So next door. This was nine weeks asunder. And we had no more until a fortnight. And then it broke out in several streets and spread every way. <sighs> Uh, love Daniel Defoe's book, by the way. I'll mm-hmm. go more into that later. You freaking love that, love that book. So let's talk about conspiracy and hysteria. Hell yeah, let's <clears throat> talk about conspiracy and hysteria. Conspiracy theorists seem to be created in great numbers in the plague of 1665, as in our plague of 2020. Mm-hmm. In Journal of the Plague Year, Daniel Defoe says... I could fill this account with the strange relations such people gave every day of what they had seen and everyone was so positive of seeing what they pretended to see that there was no contradicting them without breach of friendship or being accounted rude or unmannerly on the one hand and profane and impenetrable on the other. Sounds like Facebook. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Smoking tobacco excessively, filling the house with flowers and herbs... People would be quite paranoid and would convince themselves that they could see hearses, coffins, and arms with swords in the clouds. So they're making shapes out of the clouds and they're going, oh my lord, I'm seeing the end of the world is coming. Yep. 
People tried to interpret dreams in order to find omens of God. Daniel Defoe talks about a woman that was saying that she could see omens of God in the sky, such as an angel in the clouds. So Defoe's protagonist... So let me just explain his book. So the Journal of the Plague Year. Mm -hmm. Daniel Defoe was actually about five or six at the time. Mm -hmm. And it is believed that he took his uncle, uh, Henry Foe, his journals, and he created a novel. Okay. So it's like presented as as a as a journal. Um, it's based on truth, and we it is used as a sort of text. Yeah. Uh, even though it is, so he wrote Robinson Crusoe. So he's like a big deal writer mm-hmm. anyway of yeah, fiction. Right. Um, so it's kind of taking the the um, the the journals and turning them into something. Uh, yeah, a little bit more legible. Yeah, yeah right. it's kind of like half fiction, half, but it's based on true. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So Defoe's protagonist, HF, declares he cannot see any such thing in the clouds, to which she tells him to basically educate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Do your own research. Yes, yes. Like, you know, interpret interpret your the research. <laughs> and stuff. Look again. Yeah, yeah. Don't believe everything you see in the clouds. Mm, in the clouds. Defoe writes, she turned from me, called me profane fellow and a scoffer, told me that it was time of God's anger and dreadful judgments were approaching and that despisers such as I should wander and perish. <laughs> wander and perish, Lana. Wander and perish. Come on. So it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like they, oh, they, they were literally telling each other, go kill yourself. Yeah, yeah, this is insane. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? I mean, it's insane now. It's like... What? Wander and perish. I, You know what? I'm going to keep that in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I need it. Wander and perish. In 1666, the book, it is written, the Duke's Playhouse was a former tennis court that had been converted to a theatre within the parish of St. Giles in the Fields. Peeps was there with his wife to watch actor Thomas Betterton in the tragedy Mustafa. Yet by far the most esteemed member of the audience that afternoon was King Charles II himself. Damn. Though they didn't know it, the group was in one of the most perilous parishes of all England. So it was at this time that King Charles II actually went to the College of Surgeons in April, just when the cases are about to really pick up. And he wanted to inquire how his subjects could be best protected against illness. That's very nice of him. However, oh, however. <laughs> in time, he fled to the country. Okay. Yeah, there, and there it is. <laughs> As did many of the nobility. Although in his defence... His girlfriend was pregnant. Okay, well... With their fourth uh, child. You know, you know. Yeah. Fourth child. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was quite attached to his mistress. Um, <laughs> Classic. So I've, I've um, called this next next bit section, Plexit, to stay or to leave. <laughs> no. <laughs> Plexit? <laughs> Oh, my God. Fantastic. In Journal of a Plague Year, Daniel Defoe's protagonist wrestles with his conscious, uh, conscience about whether to leave London or stay. He asks his brother, a very devout, devout man, what he should do as he does not want to leave his business. His brother argues that it is God's will whether he lose his business should he survive the plague. But he says he could lose his business and his life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of at risk of losing everything, my dude. Uh, like it's not. Yeah, <laughs> you could lose your business and leave. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Or you could lose your business and die. And die. The brother then leaves for Bed- Bedfordshire <laughs> yeah, yeah. with his family and encourages <laughs> yeah. HF to do the same. Fair. He's like, well, we're going. You're like out of the. I'm going to give you thirty options. seconds. Get on the wagon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So HF continues to debate with himself on whether to leave London, but complains that his servant betrayed and left him for the country. (laughs) He also finds that there is not a horse to be hired as they had all been taken out of town, which means he can't get anywhere anyway. Yeah, going on foot's probably not the best option. Well, we'll come to that later. 
HF then becomes ill for a few days with a fever, which he takes as a sign from God that he must stay in London. Oh. In any case, if he left London, he would have to obtain a certificate of health before leaving. Right. And even if he had one of those, other towns were becoming cautious of letting anyone in from London, often turning them away. Fair. So they needed a plague passport. Right. <laughs> exactly. They needed to see a doctor. They were gets themselves signed off, and they would leave. So the later we get into 1665, the less chance you have of being able to leave London. Yeah, wow, that's very scary. So many Londoners fled to the country to escape the pestilence, but coming from London, unless they had a family that could give them refuge, inns often would not take them in, Mm. even if they had a certificate of health from London. Yeah, right. They didn't want a bar of it. Yeah, they didn't want to risk it. So as a result, many who left London on foot died from starvation or exposure, often found sheltering in barns. Oh, wow. Many of them carried plague with them to other towns and villages, thus spreading the distemper further outside London. That's what I was just thinking. I was like, yeah, you want to flee, but aren't you just spreading it? Isn't mm-hmm. this <laughs> isn't this causing more problems? What does it remind you of? Mm, I was I was Lockdown. literally I was literally just thinking that before I was like, ha ha ha, history repeats itself. And as you're talking, I'm like, history repeats itself. Yeah, no, let's go have a freedom protest. Yeah, yeah, let's go make sure that everyone knows. Perish. Wander and perish. Wander and perish. (laughs) (laughs) That is what they are doing. It is not known exactly, as in London, how many people died in the country. So uh, London, I guess, it's a centre of industry. They had their shit together more. Mm. So if you're living out in the country, you're not really going to be taking notes. No, there's probably no need. You're not going to have a big journal. You're not thinking about 400 years in the future. Who's going to care? Yeah, they're thinking about making it to tomorrow, probably. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, in small villages and towns, they were not counted by the bills and people buried in their own in common areas. So they would pull the bodies into the graves with hooked sticks. <laughs> Keeping in mind to stay away from the wind so that the miasma should not spread from the bodies to themselves. They're learning. They're so learning. So the wind is coming from behind them and they're pulling the bodies with, so a, it's, with a hook get it, it's, into the grave. It's sounding a little Looney Tunes to me, like a big... Yeah, <laughs> it is a little stage. bit. But, it, it, you know, the I system works. I can understand works. why. Yeah, yeah. You can't argue <laughs> that the system doesn't work because it, it, it's working. Yeah. Daniel Defoe says that the streets of London had changed to become very quiet Mm. and that people had begun to walk down the centre of the street rather than along the sides in order to stay away from the houses. Right. There began to be cancellation of major town events such as markets, fairs, mayoral events and dinners. So things sucks. (laughs) Really wind down. And, you know, half the people aren't even there anyway. Yeah. So it's a quiet, quiet place. So even in the 17th century, people knew the effectiveness of social distancing. Mm -hmm. And so it was decreed that if the pestilence was suspected in a house within London, the house should be, quote, shut up. Okay. But before this was to be done, the following process would occur. The closing of each house involved a team of people, each with a different job to do. Mm -hmm. First, the examiners, who were allocated by a system of conscription to work as such for a period of two months at a time. Okay. So, yes. I'm guessing people weren't volunteering to do that job. They were not. Mm. They would enter the house and decipher whether the marks of the plague doth dwell there such as the bu- buboes, the rash, yes. the headache, the fever. Yeah. Um, and if so, who were the close contacts associated with the house? <laughs> it is so similar. This is like so crazy. <laughs> right? This. It's not journal, that crazy, but it's like. <laughs> journal of a Plague Year was written in like 1706. Oh, my I God. Mean, Did anyone read that when COVID was coming new. up? It's not new. <laughs> 
Uh, it was determined that the plague was in fact present in the house. Then the house would be locked and shut up, after which a watchman would be set to guard those inside. Wow. Finally, upon learning that a death or deaths had occurred with the home within the home, those known as the searchers would enter, along with a chirurgeon or a surgeon. Oh, okay. Searchers were often older ladies armed with a long stick, apparently science works, <laughs> with which to poke a corpse. They could focus. Yeah. <laughs> They could earn a small amount of money for each body they identified had died of plague. <laughs> Compensation. So searchers, examiners and chirurgeons could not have any other employment in case of cross-contamination. Fair. So you couldn't just like, you know, work in childcare and then <laughs> search houses at night. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Day job and then no. um, I'm You're off not, to go poke corpses at not night. not going to be a barista. No. <laughs> In Defoe's book, it looks as though it was seen as a chore akin to jury duty right. to be called for work as an examiner. Oh. Those chosen were forced to do this job by pain of imprisonment. Oh, my God. You kind of, yeah, you didn't have a massive choice. Because let's face it, if you're put in prison during plague times, you're going to die. You're going to die. Oh, honey, I just got the letter. I've got to go poke corpses. Yes. Ah. In the book, he, for some reason, Daniel Defoe, only needs to work as an examiner for a few weeks. Mm. And he is most happy to be free of the burden. Yeah, I'd, I'd take that as a win. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> now, the examiners, don't forget, um, they, they really only have to be there to oversee mm -hmm. the, the thing. It's the searchers that do the real work. Yeah, yeah. When people noticed symptoms of plague on one of their household, they were expected to summon an examiner within two hours. Damn. After the house was ascertained to be stricken with the distemper, the door was locked and a red cross a foot long was painted on the door, along with a note hammered on top that read, Lord have mercy upon us. Damn. All right. Yeah. So how are they – do they get – do they – is there like – Uber Eats, like, are they food delivering to these people? Kind of. <laughs> we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. The ritual of being shut up was similar around the country. In Cambridge, the quarantine was 40 days, but Defoe once mentions four weeks for London, so it's not really clear what quarantine... I think it might have changed from place to place. Yeah. In The Great Plague, A People's History, the story of a woman named Ellen Lawrence is told. She lives in Cambridge and saw that her husband, Richard, was suffering from headache, shivering, and was painfully thrashing around as he tried to rest. Mm. See, she sat with him all night and tried to feed him chamomile tea. In the morning, she no noticed that he had developed buboes and sent for the examiners within the two hours of diagnosis, as was recommended. Mm -hmm. So before this, it could have just been a headache. It could have just been yeah. any illness. But she's like, right, you got the buboes. We've got to get the examiners. Yeah, it's time. Right. Richard died within a matter of days, and Ellen and her daughter, Sarah, had to stay in the house for 40 days after. Oh. They would pass coins in a bowl of vinegar... So the neighbours could get them food. Oh, okay. So they would pass it through the window. Right. Yes. Oh, coins. So it's like disinfecting the coins. That's right. For the Right. That is so interesting. Yeah. And very kind of the neighbours. I feel like Cambridge was a nicer place to have plague mm. than London. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the Great Plague, the People's History, is about plague just in Cambridge. Okay. And Cambridge was basically just a small – it was a bustling but small farming town, essentially, mm. a small city. Yeah. Um, but I think in London people weren't quite so nice to each other. Yeah. It sounds like there was an iron ring around London, that yeah. kind of vibe. Yes. So while in home quarantine, people would yell from the streets to see if anyone was still alive in the shut-up houses and asked if they needed anything. Oh, I mean, you couldn't phone them, so you just had to yell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little pebble, pebble on the yes, window. pebble on the window. An interesting thing that I read was that there didn't seem to be many reports of sneezing, which suggests that 
there was a great deal of bubonic cases, not, not. pneumonic. Interesting. And it, it's hard because, like, the, uh, quite often, like, th- with plague, there's still a lot of questions. Mm-hmm, of course. But I kind of got the impression that it was more of a bubonic outbreak th- than a pneumonic. Well, I, I suppose that's the bubonic one is maybe the one we hear about the most, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. But pneumonic is when the plague gets into your lungs. Yeah, yeah. So if you sneeze, you cough, backwards. you're really passing it on. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So yeah. I, I suppose like the, the language around it might just be a little bit convoluted. However, the rate that the illness went through the population suggests that there must have been some cases of pneumonic plague as this would have helped it spread via breath. Mm. However, small cottages with thatched roofs were also perfect conditions for plague fleas. Of course. So often in London, the watcher of the house would be the one to bring water and food. Uh, So the watcher being the watchman. Yes. So he was the watchman. He's the guard. Yeah. But he would also be like, they would pass him the coins and the vinegar and he would go get them. Yeah, some some things to eat. And the shutters in on the windows would be taken off so that the occupants could pass money and ask for extra food or medicine. It would appear that in Cambridge, a much smaller city, people acted as more of a community, whereas in London, they seemed to be quite individualistic. Mm. Uh, in the book The Great Plague, A People's History, it is said that one family in Cambridge had so many cases that they were in quarantine for four months. Oh, damn. Yeah. Let's talk about the plague doctors. Oh, please. It has been in the back of my mind hearing about these, like, <laughs> searches and watches and things like that. So, the, and also, like, the searches. So, the examiners, you would be conscripted to be an examiner. Mm-hmm. The um, the searches often were quite women that really needed money. Okay. Okay, so we're not talking medical professionals at all. No. Yeah. It was a crap job. It was a very dangerous job. And uh, quite often this, the searches were not really conscripted. They, they were people because you could... Volunteering. Go, volunteering. Yeah, to do this awful, awful job. Yeah. But what of the plague doctors of popular law? The, the kind of the symbol of of the plague. Yes. If you will. Those terrifying birds of prey and of leather and of death. Mm. Where are they that dwell upon the covers of the history books? For there is no mention of them in any of my readings of the British plagues of 1665. Which is wild, isn't it? Because it's not one. And I read like five books. Yeah, that's the first thing you think of when you think play. You think of the big the big bird mask and the hat and the fully right. covered. Like I I even used to teach kids that about the plague doctors, but you can't find anything on them. Not mentioned anyway. Not in England. Not in England. Okay. Perhaps we should be looking for the French médecin de la peste in relation to not the plague but the peste bubonique. Oh. So I was like, where are the freaking plague doctors, yeah. right? <laughs> it's, we're on to part three. Where are they? I even messaged Rebecca Rydell, who wrote 1666. I'm like, where are the plague doctors? She didn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, did she answer? <laughs> so I was like, okay, what's plague doctor in French? And what's plague doctor in Italian? Mm. Once I put those into Google, I was able to get some answers. Okay. It's a little bit different. Yes. So from live science, according to Michel Tibari, oh my Lord, Tibay-Rock, 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 his book, Encyclopedia of Infectious Diseases, the first mention of the famous plague doctor costume is found in a mid-17th century work written by Charles Delorme, a royal physician at the service of King Louis the Thirteenth of France. Sorry, I had to decipher those. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you had to translate Roman the Roman. <laughs> yeah. Delorme wrote that during a 1619 plague in Paris, he developed an outfit made entirely of Moroccan goat leather. So I'm guessing it's pretty tough. Yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Including boots, breeches, a long coat, hat, and gloves. 
Wearing this protective equipment suggests that doctors had grown more concerned about catching plague directly from their patients rather than from the air itself. Yes. Medical professionals, such as they were in France, were creating an early form of PPE. Yes, that's what it um it definitely looks like. Fully, right. fully covered. Um, more terrifying. More, but... Way more terrifying. <laughs> uh, the iconic plague doctor was somewhat similar to modern protective clothing used in hospitals today. It has also been said that plague doctor outfits were seen in Rome during an outbreak there in 1656. So about nine years before this plague, where they were called Medico de la Peste. It it featured a leather hat with a rim and leather gloves. The gown was made of linen sometimes that had been waxed to prevent liquids from seeping into it. And it also kept the fleas out. That was to my understanding that like the, the fabric was either so thick um, I didn't even consider the waxing. That's such a smart idea. So, yeah, nothing can get through. Right. Finally, a black mask that was presumably also leather or waxed linen covered the face with glass goggles built in and a large curved beak protruding out and two holes for breathing. A tight hood was worn over the mask and under the hat, ensuring that nothing could get to the skin. So they were really covered up. Yeah. Because people still believed that the plague was carried on miasma or bad air, the beak was filled with flowers and spices. If the plague doctor could only smell good things, the bad air couldn't get through the mask. Perfect logic. Right. (laughs) Perfect logic. As in the 14th century... Many doctors fled the city when plague numbers became high. Many people did if they could afford to, including royalty and the nobility. But the majority of people simply couldn't afford to leave London and were forced to stay and take their chances. So in France and Italy, the plague doctor becomes an iconic figurehead of 17th century pestilence. But contrary to popular belief, this plague doctor costume is not recorded to have been used in England. It's merely been adopted into British history for the horror factor. Yeah, that that's it right there, isn't it? Like, um, just recalling it, you want a bit of a... Uh, an icon to represent it and it just it fits so perfectly into the london vibe yeah yeah and you know what's interesting the the cut co- the front cover of uh the great plague of people's history features a plague doctor costume it's got nothing to do with it <laughs> and that's why i was so confused i was yeah. like but did I miss something? Should I listen to it again? Like, yeah, wh- what am I missing here? Why is this? And even if you watch the documentary that I watched, I think it's called Fire and Plague, there were plague doctors in that. So you can't even watch a reliable documentary. <laughs> They're lying to us. They're lying. I, I, so you're telling me that London stole something from another... <laughs> <laughs> the British stole something British from someone else's stole. culture. <laughs> Never. What? No way. <laughs> um, and and so there we will leave London okay. uh, until we come back wow. for part four of Plague. Four. I loved that. That that is like some of the most um like iconic and um not commonly known things but when i think of plague it's things like this Mm -hmm. i can't believe how um how reminiscent it is how how familiar it is of our own plague it is um and how privileged we are to have at least entertainment (laughs) while we were stuck in our houses right (laughs) yeah 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 that's right that was so good thank you Gemma. For your, your hard Thank work. Thank you for listening to my ongoing obsession. <laughs> and you'll come back with like crazier hair and you're like, all right, now, next. I haven't slept in two weeks. <laughs> plague. Mm, yes. Um, awesome. I love those. Aw- Just so you know books. as well, this this Plague series is going to – I have no intention of stopping. Oh, oh I'm so part glad. Part four is not going to be the end. Oh, so th- you said that before. You're like, yeah, yeah. And then the, like the next part and I was like, we're, we're still going. Yeah, there's going to be at least five parts Fantastic. to play. I mean – there just must be so much 
Uh, obviously, you're making multiple parts. Um, but for all the different parts of history that you have to research, it is mind-boggling. So uh, yeah. thank you for your hard work. Thank you. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to finally get, like, some answers <laughs> and understand it a little bit better. But um, oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And I highly re- recommend the uh, Diary of Samuel Pepys read by Kenneth Branagh because oh, yeah. he is actually hilarious. You know what I'm going to be He's quite naughty, to. actually. Oh, yeah. awesome. <laughs> I, will, I would love to. It's always fun to read, like, actual recollections of times. Even though, like, he did not really represent the, the general. The every Joe. <laughs> because he's, you know, he's a wealthy guy. Yeah. And he can afford a lot of luxuries. Mm-hmm. Um, the privileged state he was in, probably. But just some days, like, he, it's so funny the things that he records like one day he's like i had a pajama day (laughs) he's like i got up i didn't even get dressed i just hung out isn't that wild (laughs) yeah so many parallels yes oh my god we're um yeah humans we're we're pretty all similar (laughs) regardless of era time what's going on we're still basically the same we're pretty basic in our wants and needs yes. <laughs> pajama days yes and sitting on wheels to watch ex- executions yes <laughs> i know i do <laughs> oh well thank you Gemma. that was awesome and i can't wait for the next next installment thank you wonderful right. well until next time everybody thank you so much for watching as always check us out on instagram i think my fridge is haunted and on youtube i think my fridge is haunted because we mm-hmm. want to be youtubers we want youtubers now yeah, yeah. share it with what your do you friends. do for a living uh, content I'm a youtuber you, youtuber content creator isn't that what it's called now right content. social media consultant yes <laughs> consultant well until then Gemma, <sighs> be creepy but don't be a creep about it. Woo! Bye. <laughs> <laughs>